Hello, welcome all, and thank you for joining us um, for this evening's panel. We are delighted, I should say who I am first. I'm Andrea Stanton, the Senior Associate Dean for the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences at the University of Denver. Um, and on behalf of my colleagues, we are delighted to be able to showcase this evening um, this great group of faculty and students from our college. Um, as I think you know, they will be sharing tonight examples of the initiatives that they have developed to innovate uh, their research, um, scholarship, their teaching, and their community engagement. And all of this has been supported by our Center for Innovation in the Liberal and Creative Arts. Um, our panel tonight will be moderated um, by my colleague, Derrigan Silver. Derrigan is an associate professor in the Department of Media, Film, and Journalism Studies, and an adjunct faculty member in our Sturm College of Law. And he is the first faculty director of Silka, our Center for Innovation in the Liberal and Creative Arts at the University of Denver. Derrigan, I'll turn the floor over to you to talk about Silka uh, and to tell us who we'll be hearing from this evening. Thanks, Andrea. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. And, um, I want to thank both Andrea for her uh, her steadfast support of Silka and our Silka projects and being a, a great collaborator and a great partner in the Dean's office. I want to thank you for being here tonight to listen to our panelists, and I want to thank our faculty uh, panelists and our student panelists. We're going to begin tonight by uh, briefly explaining what Silka is and what we do. But I am going to keep it brief because um, I think the really interesting people here that are going to talk tonight is we have faculty and staff from three of the projects that we have sponsored over the last four years. Um, and I think they are doing some of the really interesting stuff that you'll wanna hear about uh, tonight, uh, rather than the overview of what Silka is. But to sort of frame it, I would like to explain uh, sort of who we are and what it is we do. And to do that, I'm going to uh, quickly share my screen. I have a brief PowerPoint that I would like to, to take a look at. All right, hopefully that is up and running now. Um, the Center for Innovation in the Liberal and Creative Arts is really a cornerstone of our last strategic initiative um, that was brought about by Dean Danny McIntosh um, in spring of 2008. Danny had the idea that innovation should have a home, it should have a place where it lives. Um, and that's why he created the Center for Innovation in Liberal and Creative Arts. I'm not gonna spend very much time talking about the process for how we select um, initiatives uh, because that would take some time. What I do want to do is just cover very briefly what kind of program Silka supports. Uh, the number one thing to emphasize is that we are faculty and student driven. Frequently in centers of higher education, you have individuals who decide what innovation is going to be from a top down approach. Uh, they tell faculty how they're going to innovate. They tell faculty um, what the new thing coming down the turnpike is. We try to avoid that. All of our ideas come from faculty and many of those ideas come from the students that they work with. So we are very much a bottom up approach to innovation. We don't tell people how to innovate. We listen to what they're doing that is already innovative and then we support it. We look for programs that are multidisciplinary connecting faculty and students across DU. This is not just in the college. Uh, many of our programs stretch across the, the units at DU. We'll talk a little bit later about the different units that we have involved in our programs. <clears throat> We look for projects that are transformational, uh, that do more than simply rethink what we're doing, that really try to change the way students learn, change the way faculty conduct research, and change the way that students and faculty interact at the University of Denver. And I think you're gonna see a really great um, examples tonight when we have our students and our faculty talk together. We support experiential learning. We support learning that is uh, committed to creating community partnerships. We look for projects that are sustainable. Uh, we want things that need a little bit of help, um, to get off the ground. We look for faculty that have already started projects or have projects that they've really thought deeply about and are very passionate about. We give them a little bit of time, a little bit of space and a little bit of money uh, to get those things going. Uh, but when we hope they'll, they'll be sustainable beyond our, our uh, initial contribution. And then we support projects that are keystone experiences or support high impact learning practices. We can talk a little bit about that later if you're interested in what those are. And then we always focus on projects that are uh, focused on social ju justice, both on our campus and our wider community. We started in spring of 2018 uh, with these uh, six Silka projects. Um, these were our initial projects that we looked to get off the ground. 
generally we provide one to two years of funding. Um, some of these have been very successful in terms of their ongoing um, uh, work. The Casa de Paz Learning Initiative involves five different uh, departments across campus. Um, the um, prison, DU Prison Arts Initiative has been very successful in finding outside funding, as has the Clinic for Open Source Arts. The Psychology Keystone Internship Initiative is still running as well, um, whereas the Interfaith and Interlinish Dialogue and the Praxis Keystone Experiences were really great experiences, but what we learned from them is they were not necessarily sustainable. And that's one of the, the premises of Silka, is we don't look for things that we automatically know are going to be successful. Um, we want the fail. We want the freedom to fail. We want to try things that are truly innovative. And if everything we do succeeds, then we're not being really innovative. Um, in 2019-20, we continued with these four projects, uh, providing them an additional second year of support in a variety of ways. But then we also added uh, five new projects. So this was a busy year for us in 2019-2020. We actually had nine different projects going at the same time. The Ethnography Lab focuses on uh, students, faculty, and staff from across campus who use ethnography in their research methods. Uh, integrated Practices and Degree Synthesis was a um, joint program between our School of Art and Art History and the Biology program. Uh, teaching Performers to Research is located in the Lamont School of Music. We did another political science uh, internship in addition to the psychology. And then we sponsored the DU MigraHack Keystone Initiative, which was a hackathon dedicated to storytelling about migration issues. Um, 2020, 2021, uh, we may all remember there was something called COVID that hit us in March of 2020, 2021. Uh, and so um, our, the number of initiatives we had definitely uh, decreased. Um, we only had four that year. Um, you'll see that I have DU Media highlighted because that is actually a program that we will highlight tonight and we'll ask some of those faculty to talk about it. Um, in 2021, 2022, we came back very strong. Uh, we added a number of different initiatives to the program um, through the generous funding of donors to Silka. Uh, we, we sponsored another program, an ongoing program in psychology, where we've developed micro credentials. Uh, we'll be hearing a little bit about CMIS tonight. Uh, we have a great program called uh, Cause Classrooms to Careers that focuses on uh, how liberal arts students can um, leverage their experiences in the liberal arts classroom. Uh, the arts and humanities uh, to focus on their careers. Uh, we have another economics keystone initiative that's working on uh, internships, uh, the Spanish program for heritage bilingual students keystone initiative, and then something called the MFJS threaded and themed keystone initiatives. I ran through those very quickly. If you do a simple Google search for uh, DU Silka, uh, it'll take you to our landing page and you can learn a little bit more about all these projects. But again, I really wanna focus on these three projects and kind of tell you a lot about them and let the faculty who, who, who created these ideas and have nurtured them and have grown them in really amazing ways talk about them. Um, over the last four years, uh, Silka has sponsored 21 different initiatives. Um, those initiatives have come from faculty in 17 different cause departments. Uh, and those faculty, even though they're the ones who've generated them, They've worked with individuals from five other units on campus, including the Graduate School of Social Work, the Graduate School of Professional Psychology, the Ritchie School of Engineering and Computer Science, the Sturm College of Law, and the Corbell School for International Studies. Uh, we've provided 19 course releases provided by funds from COS and the Office of the Provost to faculty over the last four years. Um, you know, if you talk to faculty, in addition to money, what one of the things they really need is time. And so you know, the course releases are really key to our success. In addition, we've distributed uh, just about $450,000, a little bit over that, in grants and gifts and internal funds uh, to faculty across campus. Um, the vast majority of those come from uh, grants and gifts that we've received from generous individuals and generous foundations who believe uh, in, the, in what we are doing. We've engaged in hundreds of hours of community interactions, and we've had hundreds of students contact hours. Um, so we've done a lot in four years. It's been very busy. Um, but again, rather than going over all 21 initiatives, we've decided tonight that you would really enjoy hearing from three very specific initiatives that have been very successful. And so with that in mind, I'm going to stop my screen share. And I'm going to introduce our first project and introduce you to, to our first speakers. Um, first, talking about CMIS uh, that we've already covered a little bit uh, is going to be uh, Allison Krogel and uh, Keeling Vargas. Allison is an associate professor of Andean 
and Quechua Studies in the Department of Spanish Language, Literature, and Cultural Studies. Additionally, Allison is affiliated faculty in the Latin American Center at the Corbell School of International Studies. Keelan Vargas graduated from DU in December 2021 with a Bachelor of Science in Geographic Information Sciences, or GIS, and with minors not just in computer science, but also in math. One of the things that I want to highlight is the, um, the three students that you'll be hearing from tonight representing our three programs are really very emblematic of students in cause. They're individuals who are not forced to focus on one interest or another. You will see that they also have, they all have multiple majors and multiple minors. And one of the beautiful things about cost is it's really set up so that students can live and be their whole selves. We don't ask them to be a one thing, just a math major or just a computer science major, but DU and particularly cause really allows them to embrace all aspects of their personality. And I think you're gonna learn that when you hear them speak tonight. With that in mind, I'll turn this over to Dr. Krogel to tell you about CMUS. Thank you. Thank you, Dargan and Andrea, for your introductions. And hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, it's my pleasure to participate in this event tonight to share some details with you all about DU's forthcoming Center for International Mountain Area Studies. And as Darigan mentioned, I'm happy to be joined tonight with Keelan Vargas, one of my undergraduate student research partners. Many students have worked on several of these projects tonight, but Keelan's been with me <laughs> through the long haul, including um, really early on in the pandemic. So I'm happy that she was able to, to join us tonight to talk about some of her work on this project. So in Spanish, um, CMS, um, is a plural noun and it refers to summits or highest points of various mountains and to sort of the apex or culmination of a process or a project or an artistic creation. So we think that that this is a very apt acronym for the project, um, which is conceived of as um, being a space that can advance not just social science research and humanities focused research, but also moving across campus to integrate the work of our colleagues in the environmental sciences and sustainability studies, biological sciences and geography and uh, GIS, because a lot of these fields are, are deeply imbricated, imbricated and very interesting uh, to work cross disciplinarily, but um, sometimes we're, we're, we don't have the opportunity to, to collaborate. So CMUS is sort of designed to facilitate this. And uh, the idea is that it would serve as a multidisciplinary research and teaching hub that really is focused on community engaged research projects and collaborations, not just within Colorado and the Rocky Mountain West, but also abroad. And that it will really offer opportunities for faculty and student research partnerships uh, across campus and also integrating students' rich experience prior to and after study abroad. I work with so many students who study abroad as a Spanish professor, and a lot of my students study in highland uh, regions throughout South America and also in other parts of the world. And I think that uh, what is lacking is a little bit of uh, thinking through what the community-based research project is going to be abroad and how that can be integrated uh, into the student study during their fourth year, usually the study abroad in the third year. So how can we tailor their study abroad experience and integrate that into their coursework once they return to campus and even prior to their study abroad? So CMUS really, um, I think, it's a lot of the goals of of the Keystone Initiative, calling for high impact initiatives, uh, cultural inclusion, economic equality, and multidisciplinary approaches is definitely sort of integral to the, to the idea of, of CMUS. And if we look at DU Impact 2025, that's asking for knowledge bridges, cross-campus partnerships, and really training students to go out into the world and make an impact in various different ways and to integrate their various uh, studies throughout their four years at DU, I think that a space such as CMIS will, will provide that for students. Um, and I, I should also mention that CMIS is focused on bridging rural urban divides, which is something that sometimes doesn't receive as much attention as I think it should 
within universities that are located in urban centers. So one of the projects that is ongoing that uh, is related to the CMIS uh, Center is called Musuh Iya, and it's a digital humanities collective that was launched a year ago today already. And if you're interested in seeing what we've been doing with this project, you can go to musuhiya.info. And if you want to know what it means, there's an explanation in Spanish, Quechua, or English. You can choose which language you would wish to interact uh, with the platform. And it's a collaboration with more than 20 poets throughout the Andes and within the Andean global, global diaspora that was really sort of launched during the pandemic and has been really exciting as a space for poets to publish written and uh, oral versions of their of their work. And it's been coded to be really accessible in low bandwidth areas and on um, mobile devices that are maybe not up to date or um, weren't very expensive to begin with. So it works well in uh, rural communities and teachers are already using it um, throughout the Andes, which is really exciting. So as, a, um, as an ongoing keystone experience opportunity, there are lots of opportunities with Musuhiya for students in various different fields. I've highlighted a few of them here. This is emerging digital practices. There are lots of opportunities for internships and um, even in work both virtually and while students are abroad in, in various different areas, depending on the student's areas of interest. And then just very briefly, the second project that CMIS has been working on over the past few years is called the Aspen Arbor Glyph Archives Project. And this is focused on um, collecting sheep herder testimonies from about the last hundred years um, that are left on aspen trees as, as carvings and uh, carvings on the trees, which is where the arbor glyph comes from. Um, and really we're seeking to chronicle the establishment of sheep husbandry in the United States and specifically in Colorado through various lenses, socio-historical, economic, environmental, and in terms of shifting patterns of oftentimes marginalized migrant laborers. Um, so that's the, the large project. And we have a lot of community partners, both in Denver and in uh, Northwest Colorado. Here are a few of them that we've been working with for the past several years already. And uh, on campus, we have three different departments actively collaborating on this project. Um, and uh, one of the citizen scientists and photographers, Mark Chapman, who might be in the audience uh, tonight, donated um, slides from decades ago to the project, which the photography department at DU was able to scan. And so now we have this archival um, documentation as well that we were able to integrate into the project. And then the Department of Geography and specifically the Geographic Information Science Project is creating both print and digital maps for uh, gallery shows that are gonna open in Denver in the fall of 2022, and then in uh, rural Colorado going into uh, fall of 2022 and winter of 2022 in Route and Moffat County. So uh, just west of DU's new mountain campus, just jumping over one county <laughs> uh, and the two uh, more, most Northwestern counties of Colorado is, is where we're focusing on here. So I'll just briefly run through um, some of the maps that the undergraduate geographic um, G GIS studies uh, students have created. Um, and this one, for example, is showing the first arrival of sheep, which is European animal, into what is now uh, New Mexico, the state of New Mexico in the late 16th, early 17th century. The uh, notorious Spanish conquistador Juan de Oñate is the first one to do this. And you can see through these interactive maps on the digital project um, how these first uh, herds arrived into New Mexico. This is important to us as well because so many migrant laborers in Northwest, Northwestern Colorado beginning in the, about the 1940s were from these three counties in New Mexico. And so uh, Keelan made this map. And um, if you go to the digital story map page that Keelan is uh, working on, you can, inter you can interact with the map itself and zoom in and look at which specific arbor glyphs were signed by which herders in which decade and what their message was. So 
Um, it's very exciting. It's going to, it's going to be a bilingual, trilingual actually, because there's some Quechua elements here as well, website. So um, a lot of our partners in Highland Peru are very excited about this as well, because they'll be able to visit the exhibit digitally. So um, I think Keelan is here. I'll keep sharing my screen and maybe she can tell us a little bit about her experience uh, working on this project as an undergraduate research assistant. Hi everyone, um, my name is Keelan. Um, so I got involved in this project because Allison just sent an email out to the whole geography department last year. Um, and I reached out because it was located in Route County, which is where I grew up. So I thought it would be really cool to like work on something that I was in somewhere that I was familiar with. Um, and it's, it's even more interesting because I personally had no idea about the history of sheep herding and Northwest Colorado or like in my own county at all before. So I've learned a lot through this and I'm hoping that it will do the same thing for other people um, in kind of Northwest Colorado and in Denver. Um, but I would say that I, I got a really good overview of kind of what applications of GIS there are out there, but this project has been a really deep dive into something that's so interdisciplinary um, and it's just a really cool topic to work with um, and like use GIS tools and stuff on because it can, um, these certain like maps and like web applications can illustrate not just spatial data, but like really important historical stories of people. Um, and I think that especially like these web applications are gonna be a really valuable tool for just anyone who wants to learn more about this. Um, I made a website or like a web application that allows people to like sort by artist or uh, country of origin. So you can kind of filter and see like, oh, what arbor glyphs um, were made by people who marked like New Mexico on it. And so I think that this is just gonna be a really cool project to kind of showcase GIS in more of a social science sense. Um, one of my professors said that, or defined geography as the why of the where um, so I think that this is kind of just very um, kind of illustrative of that sort of definition. And I think it's just going to be a really great resource. Um, I'm super excited to, to finish up these web applications and stuff, but this has been a really great um, way just for me to both build on foundational like GIS skills moving forward into like the, the industry, um, but also just to work with somebody from a different department and learn a lot about um, Colorado in general and this sort of historical thing. So yeah, it's been really great. Thank you, Keelan. And I just want to say one last thing. Keelan's databases, as a computer science and mathematician, I'm a literature professor and cultural science, uh, cultural studies professor. Um, Keelan's databases are being used by the National Forest Service now. We shared all of that information back in the summer. The, the rangers and the archeologists and the National Forest Service are very busy with forest fires in the summer and they don't have time to be, you know, collating all this data. So with Keelan's databases, they're able to make sure that certain areas with very old arbor glyphs, you know, the 1920s and 1930s, which are cultural artifacts, aren't uh, tagged for removal. So that's like a very practical uh, application uh, of, of CMS that, that we were able to, to share all of those databases. And so many projects going forward, the National Forest Service and our partners there in the Ranger Districts are very excited to work with other students in, in the future. So, so thanks for letting us uh, share a little bit about CMS and we're, ha we're happy to answer any questions if folks are, are interested in more details going forward. Thanks, Allison and, uh, and Keelan. That was really amazing. And I think it's a great example of how truly understanding any subject can't be owned by any one discipline and a really great example of how digital technologies and digital media uh, really don't mean anything without the cultural studies impact of it and the depth and the the understanding that the humanities bring to it which i think is a great segue into our next project that also looks at uh, digital media and and ways of storytelling with a very critical eye and a very critical lens that looks at how um, populations that are possibly not um, as present in, in our culture and our media background as they should be. And that's talking about um, documenting Colorado's hidden voices. It's my pleasure to introduce 
Uh, Carlos Jimenez Jr. He is an assistant professor of media, film, and journalism studies, where he specializes in digital media, labor, and immigration. Lena Reznicek um, Parado is a teaching assistant professor in Spanish language, literacy, and culture studies, and a director of the Spanish program for heritage bilingual speakers. She specializes in heritage language education and applied sociolinguistics. And Dr. Alejandro Sarron, um, who is an associate professor in cultural anthropology, where he specializes in health, human rights, and ethnographic research. And Dr. Sarron is uh, a favorite of Silka. This is actually the third initiative that he has helped get started. And so we are always thankful to Alejandro. He is truly um, an innovative thinker, and he is a gem of, um, of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Science, and we always love it when he joins a, a project. I will turn it over. I believe Lena is uh, starting us off. I'll get us going for today. Good evening, everybody. And thank you, Derrigan, for that wonderful introduction. Today, I have the great fortune of telling you about our project, Colorado's Hidden Voices. The overarching theme for this project is putting our students in direct contact with a diverse part of our Colorado community. And we're doing this in two very specific ways. The first is through an oral history project. And the second is through an internship program spread out throughout Denver, Colorado. I'll start by telling you about the first. For the oral histories, students have been trained to record and preserve voices that have been traditionally excluded from Colorado's archives. This is farmers, farm workers, essential workers, bilingual communities, to folks who have made a difference in their local community. And if this rings a bell for you, if you know someone that might fit for this, we would love for you to connect us. The oral histories that the students collect will ultimately get contributed to History Colorado's state archive where they will live on forever, making a huge benefit to the, the history that we tell of Colorado. And of course, History Colorado is a main partner in this work. In the process for the students, our students get to hear firsthand from a community member that they might not otherwise engage with. And this is really one of the many ways that we're pushing the student experience beyond the classroom. To prepare our students for, for this work, we've had a series of workshops. We had our oral history expert, Rachel Storm from History Colorado, who came and taught students the ins and outs of oral history work. I got to teach the students uh, an, oral, an audio recording workshop where they got to use professional grade equipment to eventually do their interview. And our most recent workshop was led by Lina, Professor Lina and Alejandro on language and professionalization, where she prepared the students to work with a bilingual community. And Professor Alejandro helped us connect with the DU um, career and development to really come in and prepare our students for their internship, which is what we'll talk about next. Thanks, Alejandro. Uh, sorry, thanks, Carlos. Um, you're all in my mind right now. Um, anyway, so I've kind of, I'll tell you a little bit about the internship component of our collaborative. Um, in this way, we are having students engage with hidden voices as well, but from a completely different angle. So students are going to go in um, as interns um, and collaborate with a variety of um, agencies here in Denver who primarily serve Spanish speaking communities, not all of them do, um, but we have found that there's great interest and need in the Denver um, community uh, to do this specific work. So we are paying attention to students academic interests, certainly, but we're partnering with agencies that offer a variety of opportunities for students to develop these relevant classroom to career skills in many ways. So in the next slide, you see kind of the um, student cohort academic profile. So certainly we have a lot of media uh, and Spanish majors, of course, because we're kind of leading this initiative followed by anthropology, anthropology as well. But um, what we want to do is to um, offer students um, sort of a, uh, a taste of what it is to be part of an organization um, that has a lot of different <clears throat> aspects of their work. So um, I'll show you kind of our featured partners here in the next slide. We have over 25 community organizations that have reached out to me directly um, saying that they are aching to have students from DU come to them to mentor them, to show them how they do the work that they do. You'll notice that a lot of these are specific um, 
to Spanish speaking communities, for example, the Mexican Culture Center, we have Latino Culture Arts Center, etc. But um, surprisingly, too, there are a lot of other types of agencies that have reached out and said, you know what, we're really, we're really trying to figure out how to reach out to this community and we would love to have student expertise and student um, participation in that mission. Um, so the next slide, next slide shows a little bit more about what kinds of agencies we're working with for this project. We have a lot of um, sort of nonprofit advocacy groups, um, but we also have folks who are doing a lot of health um, advocacy work, um, sustainability, food sustainability specifically, um, certainly media production firms, um, um, a lot of agencies working with equity issues in the community. Um, and there you'll see our just beautiful internship catalog that we've been able to uh, put together. Uh, in fact, we have given these to students last week. We gave them the catalog. They've been studying them. They've given us their rankings where they want to be um, matched with. And uh, we're getting excited here to to send them off um, here in the next couple of weeks or so. So I'll uh, pass it on to Antonia, who has graciously come to um, give us some of, our, of her time here. And Antonia has been with us since the beginning of this um, project. Um, and she is gonna share a little bit about um, what this has done for her own, her own student experience. So adelante, Antonia. Gracias. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I just want to introduce myself shortly. So my name is Antonia Vélez, and my passion for social justice and storytelling led me to double major in international studies and journalism and double minor in creative writing and leadership. Um, but it is also what led me to want to partake in this incredible project, which is Hidden Voices of Colorado. I knew from the get-go that this project would allow me to both showcase my abilities and learn more about what I love, um, which is connecting the dots between telling stories that directly speak to social inequalities and also cater towards my own personal and academic trajectory. Um, I've only been through the workshop process so far, as Lina explained, but even these have exceeded my expectations. I mean, the oral history workshops were amazing because we got to hear from Rachel from History Colorado, who is an experienced and passionate individual who has helped us understand the importance of oral histories and how they need to represent the diversity that exists within the communities they're representing. Um, and I've also learned so much from like about the intricacies of oral histories themselves. So the process of how they're done and the technology that goes into them, which will undoubtedly be helpful for me beyond this just this individual experience, considering my desire to dive into journalism in the future. Um, and of course, learning more about the importance of showing respect and appreciation for the different dialects that exist within languages was really very crucial, I think, because it holds so much importance on both micro and macro levels. So personally, with whomever you're interviewing, you're creating a safe environment, but then also on a broader level, you're eradicating the notion that dialects are tied to some sort of form of social value, and so you're maintaining equality in that sense. Um, the professionalism aspect of that last workshop, which was touched on earlier, um, that was facilitated by the DU Career Services was also incredibly helpful. Um, hearing different tips and tricks regarding the trials and tribulations of an internship process was very reassuring. I mean, as exciting as it is, um, it is also intimidating to know that we will be working with organizations that are actually doing some really incredible work for Colorado and even beyond that. So looking at the list of places that are willing to work with us and knowing I had to pick four choices was hard. I was just telling my professors the other day um, how all of these internship opportunities look so amazing and helpful for what I want to do with my life, which is a wonderful problem to have. Um, but after a lot of thought, I picked um, the Rocky Mountain Immigrant Advocacy Center, the African Chamber of Commerce Colorado, the Latino Cultural Arts Center and the Aurora Community Connection Family Resource Center as my top four choices. And I'm just listing them off so you see like the wide range of um, variety that there is. Um, these organizations and the internship position that I will possibly be undertaking are diverse, but they all have a shared initiative, which is to create positive social change. And that's something that I wanna be a part of um, considering my academic interests. 
Um, no matter what organization I end up working with, I'm confident that this will be an enriching experience and a stepping stone for my professional life, as I'll be exercising valuable skills like organization, time management, and networking skills, but then also learning from and being surrounded by professionals in fields that I might be in someday in the future. Um, more than this, though, it's thrilling to know that I will be creating actual tangible products through this experience. So aside from the interviews, um, also some hypothetical things that I might be doing for these organizations might be, you know, creating social media content to help with an organization's community outreach or volunteer outreach, or maybe translating a handbook to help another organization become more inclusive. Um, so that's really exciting. And then knowing that I have a broad range of things to contribute to these organizations as well, considering that I am a bilingual and bicultural person um, is also um, just wonderful and inspiring to know. Whatever it is that I end up doing, I'm glad to know that I'll be working towards social justice and I'm really thankful that I've gotten the opportunity to do so. Uh, so now I will be handing it off to Alejandro so he can wrap us up. Gracias, Antonia. Education scholars like Bell Hooks have known for many years that the best way to learn is in community. As you all can see, there is almost magic that happens when we connect students, community, and faculty. In this particular case, we are bringing together students' motivation, energy, and talents, communities' amazing work and needs, and faculty enthusiasm and expertise. What makes this magic happen are the bridges that we are able to build with support from initiatives like SILTA. So thank you, and please feel free to contact us if you would like to know more. Darren, You're amazing. Term. Oh, I am. I'll figure out Zoom just in time for us to stop using it. Um, uh, Carlos, uh, Alejandro, Antonia, um, Lena, thank you for your amazing work uh, in the community. Thank you for getting out of the ivory tower and doing this very powerful and important work. And, and Antonio, I know you're getting so much out of this from your student experience, but I know you're also giving so much back to your community. And we, we greatly appreciate that work that you're doing, uh, Antonia. Um, another program that really works on connecting students with their passion and letting students uh, really evolve beyond just the classroom at the University of Denver is DU Media. And that's the next program uh, that we will be highlighting. And we have uh, three individuals here who will talk to us uh, about um, DU Media. Uh, professor Karim El Damahure is Assistant Professor in Media, Film, and Journalism Studies Department, where he focuses on both traditional media and um, social media, particularly as it is used um, by different uh, non-national and national groups uh, throughout the world, particularly in the Middle East. Christoph Demont Heinrich is associate professor, also in media film and journalism studies department and specializes in web design and development, digital photography, digital media, global media, globalization, journalism, social media, multimedia storytelling, news reporting, and online journalism. And joining them today will be my former student who I haven't seen since she was in my class. So it's very nice to see her is Grace Gans. Grace was a double major. Uh, as you can see, as Antonio pointed out, two majors, two minors. Grace, two majors. Uh, very common here at the University of Denver that we allow our students to explore all of their interests without limiting them. Grace was a double major in journalism and music. And so I'll turn this over uh, to hear about DU Media to this group. Thanks, there again, um, and it's great being with you all and and hearing about all those amazing initiatives. And I'm also very glad to be here with my colleague uh, uh, Christoph and uh, one of my favorite students, at Grace, to talk about DU Media. Um, so I'm just going to start first by walking you through how that all started. Um, I, when, I, when I was in my undergrad, um, I was studying media and journalism. 
And I remember the studio uh, was sort of like a sacred place that you cannot like approach or get close to. I remember in four years, I actually got into that studio, I think twice or three times. So um, that also translated into us not being able to touch the equipment and the gear until like the very last year when we were working on our graduation projects. So as you can imagine, you know, going out there and, and uh, going out there into the field and starting to work, I'm, I'm a journalist by training um, and I had to learn everything basically um, in the field, like as I was working um, in the job. So um, when I went to grad school and I saw I went to certain institutions that I found how um, they really cherished student media, I saw how it was transform transformative, um, not just in my experience, but also in the experience of colleagues that I've seen and friends and peers. Um, and how it actually had students get out of college with portfolios that were literally um, as strong, if not stronger, than some of the professionals out there. So um, basically, when when I joined DU in fall 2019, um, I found that there was a studio and that it, anybody can get into. So that was, you know, amazing for me. Uh, and I also saw how the gear was available for everybody to, um, you know, play with and use. But also I saw the fascinating work that our students were doing. And I really felt that this has to be showcased. This has to be seen. Um, and thus I started working with my colleagues in the department, talking about DU Media. Um, uh, it wasn't called DU Media at the time, but like the initiative to have a student media platform. Um, so we basically uh, worked on that and it launched in February um, 2020 with the idea that any student in the department across the four majors can come to um, you know, the, the, the faculty in charge of DU Media and basically uh, pitch ideas. And then we can help them with the gear, help them with the project development, et cetera. But also more importantly, that the fantastic work that our students are doing can be showcased and not only showcased, can compete with um, student work across the country and internationally as well. And in the first year, we were actually uh, able to, our students uh, were able to get a bunch of awards, actually. Um, we got the SPJ, Society for Professional Journalists, first place in uh, di uh, digital videography. That was Grace. Um, and then we actually had the second place on the very same category. We also had the Future Broadcaster Award by the Colorado Broadcaster Association to one of our students for um, his work uh, with DU Media. And we also had uh, silver and bronze in the Tilly Award. And just yesterday, we learned that one of our students got in the BEA Broadcast um, Inter uh, Education Association, got an award of excellence in the long feature TV category. Um, so basically, um, for the first year when we were working on it, we were basically focusing on social media at the time. And then uh, my colleague, uh, colleagues were recommending Silka. And one of the amazing things that I uh, learned about Silka as we were prepping the proposal to apply is the notion of sustainability. And Dergen touched on that uh, earlier a little bit. And this was something that was on my mind. And I felt that this is really important. And thus also we applied for a course release and we were able to get it. Um, and I'm gonna leave the floor to Christoph to continue here, how we moved beyond the social media uh, presence as well. Uh, okay, Kareem, thank you very much. I think I'm gonna, can I go to sharing my own screen um, just so I can go for my own pace? Yeah, thanks. So, I, as Kareem said, we've been on, DU Media has been on the social media platforms. That's been the primary mechanism for publishing and showcasing student content. Uh, so, Facebook page, uh, YouTube uh, account, as well as an Instagram account. And uh, I was fortunate to, as Kareem talked about, get a course release in this past fall. Uh, and I worked uh, pretty hard to create a, a central showcase space, a website for DU Media and brought together a lot of content. So we have uh, multiple majors in our department of media, film and journalism studies. So we have uh, film 
majors, we have uh, journalism majors, strategic communication majors, and media studies majors. And this DU Media brings together content produced by all of those majors in particular, but not only film uh, students and journalism students. And that content was and still is sitting in different places uh, on the web and different social media spaces. And I, we wanted, Kareem and I wanted to bring it together in a central place. And so um, I worked in the fall to create a new DU Media website, uh, and that is du-media.com. And I am just going to show, go to that site a little bit here. I won't spend too much time on it. Just want to give you a sense of what it looks like. Uh, so there are hundreds uh, of articles and videos here from the last uh, year and a half uh, that students uh, from our different majors have worked on. And we have a, a structure here where, uh, on, on the website where you can locate content according to documentary film, music videos, short film. Uh, then we also have news content, articles and videos. And of course, uh, as Kareem was just talking about, uh, we have, and I need to update this to reflect the new award that we just got, uh, that the students got here, uh, but um, that's some of our award-winning content here. And then uh, DU Media has also, uh, and Kareem has also partnered uh, with Rocky Mountain PBS. And these are some of the stories that were published and broadcast on uh, Rocky Mountain PBS and their, their website produced by students here at DU. So uh, just a nice space for uh, student work that has been produced a lot of really great stuff over the last, uh, so two years or so, I guess we're almost at two years now with DU Media and we're uh, always looking for more content. And uh, one thing I do wanna show you, we have historical record now of all the content here on this page here. And if you scroll down, it's all chronological and, you, and students can find their content. And um, yeah, that's just a, an overview of, of our DU, Me, DU Media website. It's du-media.com. It's hosted actually on a story lab, DU, so that you only see the URL du-media.com when you first type it in and then then you see a different set of URLs. But um, in any case, that's a little bit over, of an overview of that. And I believe um, I'm gonna hand it now to Grace and she'll talk a little bit about maybe some of the st stories uh, and things that she's done uh, for DU Media, including this one here, which I just showed in my class, my advanced multimedia uh, web storytelling and publishing class yesterday to my students. So I'll hand it over to her. I'll stop my share. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Grace. Thank you so much for having me. It is very good to see everybody. Um, and as Derrigan said, you know, I majored in both journalism and music. So the Arts, Humanities and Social Science College is um, incredibly close to my heart. and I'm very thankful to be here. Um, I mean, I want to start by saying I really cannot speak more highly of DU Media and DU Journalism, the program and its professors in general. Um, I mean, you've already heard from a few of them and it's pretty easy to gauge just how much they care about their work and their students. Um, you know, before I was able to have experience with DU Media, I think I had a pretty one-sided experience with journalism where I was primarily studying, you know, print and web journalism, writing a lot of articles. Um, but DU Media and Kareem and the other professors multi-platform courses really opened me up to fully writing, filming, and editing full-on video pieces. Um, that was something that, you know, not only made me more passionate about storytelling, but honestly is incredibly essential to a journalism look, um, education in this modern digital world and in my current job now, um, where I work at a TV station. Um, I would say the main thing that is really so important about DU Media is the more wide-reaching ability to tell stories and to collaborate with other students and, as they were saying, professional journalists and journalism organizations in Denver and in the community. Um, one thing that Christoph was just saying that I had the opportunity to be involved in was a partnership with Rocky Mountain PBS. Um, I, along with other students, got to write and work with PBS journalists to produce um, two videos for their Colorado Voices series. 
which was really incredible, not just because of that experience in general, but um, as Kareem was saying, the ability to learn the real world technology and editing software that I'm now using professionally and was able to learn in college before I was able to use it um, in my job now. Um, and then finally, the last thing I wanted to say um, through DU Media, as Kareem was saying, I was able to win an award from the Society of Professional Journalists for one of those projects. Um, and he was saying that DU Media has also allowed me to have my work from senior year be submitted for SPJ and even Emmy Award consideration. That's one of the things that a lot of people don't know that college students can win Emmy Awards for journalism work. It's a very cool thing that DU Media allows students to do. Um, and you know, these applications primarily can get pretty expensive and people think that you can just send in your projects, have fun. Um, but if you want to submit your work, unfortunately there is um, funding and costs that go with that. But DU Media helps students be able to do that without cost, which is really important. Um, and so, uh, yeah, was able to help me put that on my resume in this very, very competitive field. Um, when I started working in my current job, I met so many other kids um, who went to these massive, big program, big reputation journalism schools that also had these opportunities and seeing that showed me, you know, really how valuable this program is because it really is so cool that DU, which has a very small program compared to a lot of other schools, has something that is on caliber and has something that compares so highly to these very large, very big resource programs. Um, and that really comes from just the care and the work of the faculty that you see here. Um, so yeah, I could talk forever, but I'm gonna stop. Um, thank you again, and I will turn it back. Thank you, Karim and Christoph and Grace. Um, I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to take um, host privilege, and that means I get to ask the first question before we turn to our audience. And my first question is going to be follow up on on Grace' comments there at the end. Uh, and I'm going to ask this question of of Keelan, Antonia, and Grace, and we we can go in that order. But um, I've noticed that none of you mentioned classes. These weren't things that you had to do for your major. These were opportunities sort of above and beyond um, your classwork, things that spoke to your passion, uh, you know, be it storytelling or GIS or uh, social justice. You've all mentioned those things as being very passionate to you. Um, how did these opportunities make your time at DU unique? And what did you gain from these particular opportunities um, that you don't think you would have had um, necessarily if they weren't, weren't there in place? And Keelan, you can go ahead and, and start. Sure. Um, yeah, I would definitely say that, like, my, my major and my minors are very sort of like tech and like computer science and math heavy. Um, so, like, just being able to be a part of this project was really, really valuable for me in the sense that it kind of showed me like how big of a scope GIS has and like especially in terms of like social science and storytelling um I think that you know they like in classes they'd be like oh yeah you know you can map demographics and all this stuff but I think this project really kind of honed in on like how you would do that and like what what are the important things that we want to show to people and include in these maps um so that like families of sheep herders can go through and like look at these arborglyphs that people and their family have left and sort of like construct the story from there. So um, in terms of uniqueness, I just think that like, I, I probably wouldn't have been able to like learn as much about how GIS can be applied to sort of a more anthropological lens um, if I didn't get involved with this. So I'm really grateful for CMS for that. And we're grateful that you were involved with CMS. Antonia, how do you feel like this has shaped your time at DU? Um, I definitely think that as soon as you asked that question, I was just thinking about like the response from some of my friends from maybe other schools, other states, um, when I told them about the project that I was in and the whole process and they were just like, wow, like that's so cool. Like they had never really um, experienced anything like it, like something that originated from like, like, 
a contribution of different departments of one institution and then kind of like preparing you like in a multi-faceted way to later place you into like a really cool internship that has a lot to do with you know whatever your passions are because again also we didn't go into that like a, very much in detail but not only do we have like a wide variety of places um, that we can work with, but we also have different positions available. And there's also like variety and diversity within these positions. Like if you are, if you have more of an affinity for writing, you can choose to apply for a position in an organization that has more to do with writing. If you're more into like graphic design and marketing and all of that, like creating social media content. So just having a program and like a project that is so like versatile and so like well-rounded and complete I feel like is something that usually shocks a lot of people who like learn about what I'm doing and what I'm going to be doing next spring um and so yeah I think that definitely in in a shorter in a shorter definition um I feel like this makes my experience at DU unique because it not only like prepares me fully for um, whatever position I undertake, but it also, I've learned so much in just like the few workshops that we've had. And um, I feel like it's shaping me not only as a student and like a prof future professional, but also as a person. Thank you, Antonia. Grace, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, big J schools versus small J schools. And it's obvious you had an impact and your professors had an impact on you. And I'm gonna share that Lena dropped into the chat that not only were you my student, but you were also her student. And she remembers you quite fondly. Um, and so can you expand a little bit on that ability to make these deep connections with faculty? And in your case, it's obviously faculty from a cross cause. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's pretty easy to build a relationship with faculty when you have faculty that's this good and this caring about their students. Um, I'm extremely happy that I joined the journalism program in general. Um, when I first joined, when I first came to DU, I was just a music major, um, but knew I wanted to do something with writing and um, as soon as I had my first class in the journalism program, I was like, yeah, this is it. Um, this is what I'm gonna be doing because of just the amount of care that they put into their students. Um, in terms of, and I think, I mean, speaking of DU Media specifically, um, it definitely allowed me to form relationships with other people and my professors um, and work, allow me to see how both of my passions can kind of work together because you know, before joining the journalism school in DU Media, I kind of thought of myself in two boxes, I guess. Like I had my music side and I had my journalism side. Um, and when I got to pitch my own stories um, at DU, I realized I could actually combine those interests and start telling stories about music and musicians, um, which was very cool to me um, and allowed me to expand those relationships. For example, like one of the projects that I was able to do for Rocky Mountain PBS was about my choir teacher at Lamont. Um, if you guys know who Catherine Taylor is, she's one of the most incredible people in the entire world. Um, and I was able to um, film and write a project on her. And, you know, just telling a story about someone in general, um, you immediately form a connection with them at the end of the day. And I think being able to be in journalism and having my little college job working for the Clarion, um, you know, interviewing so many of these professors and students and people in the community, um, you gain a connection with someone uh, instantly when you're talking about their story with them. So that's what I will say. Thank you, Grace. So we're, I'm gonna ask one more question. Um, and um, this one is gonna go to, to Lena and Christoph and Carlos. Um, one of you can address it or all of you can address it, uh, but we do have to be quick. So if all three of you address it, please uh, keep that in mind. Um, Christoph, you spoke about the importance of a course release. You spoke about how that freed up your time uh, to do this really important work and to get this website up and running. And Carlos and Lena, um, you've also had course releases. 
course releases are fantastic, uh, but they are not cheap. They take uh, lots of funding. Can you talk about the importance of that funding and that importance of that time to work on these projects that are obviously bringing so much to our students? And uh, Christoph, why don't you start, and then we'll, then we'll have Lena go, and then Carlos, if you if you would like to go in that order. Okay, thank you, Derek, and I. I was able to really focus on building this website for DU Media and really concentrate on designing it, picking a template, administering the template, the WordPress template, and um, bringing in a lot of content. So that was sitting in different spaces and, and getting it all in one space. And I really don't think I, I wouldn't have been able to do that in 10 weeks. Uh, not even close if I didn't have the course release. So I'm, uh, I'm really grateful that I had that. And now, now we have something that we can, as a, as a foundation that can keep, uh, D, it's not the only thing that we have, but it's a central foundation that we can run D Media on. And that's directly a result of the course release. Lena? Yeah, likewise. Um, I think I think one of the very unique and important components of our collaboration is the community partnerships and that relationship that I've been able to build um, throughout the winter quarter. I have met um, a lot of people. I have made a lot of Zoom calls and have met some of these people in person as well. Um, I kind of love meeting people and just asking questions. So I do enjoy that, but it takes a lot of work. It is a logistical monster. And without the time that this course release um, gave me, I, I, I literally would not have been able to do um, that um, sort of partnership, um, that one-on-one, -on -one, that, you know, very personable um, contact with each um, with each community partner um, that is on board. And I mean, I, I mean, I'm a teaching professor, so I teach all the time, but I see this as, you know, as, as a crucial role um, or, you know, part of my role as a teaching professor as well, and certainly would not have been able to do that without the, the, the support. Carlos, how has, a, uh, how has a course released helped you to really develop this program in, in a way, in a deep and rich and meaningful way? I mean, it's been an incredible benefit, honestly. I think some of the things that come to mind is just because we wanna do things for the students and we wanna bring them together, that level of coordination to get a space, to get food, to get the students together, to get experts to come, that level of coordination requires so much time. Um, not, to, not to mention, you know, again, the recruiting of the students themselves. And we had a couple of student employees and just being able to, to manage all of that. Um, is an incredible amount of time to get things perfect and to get things right. And uh, I probably wouldn't have been able to do any of that if it wasn't for um, the course release. Um, so that's, that's at least from my experience. Well, I wanna thank you all, uh, Alejandro, Lina, Carlos, Antonia, Christoph, Grace, Keelan. Um, uh, Karim had to leave us for another appointment and uh, Allison to leave us for another appointment, but thank you all. Uh, and now for some closing remarks, I'm gonna turn this back over to my friend and colleague, um, Senior Associate Dean Stanton. Andrea, um, it's all yours. Hi, uh, yes, thank you. I would also join in the chorus of thank yous. First, thank you to everyone for joining us this evening um, and a special thanks to Darigan for such a gracious hosting and welcoming and really thoughtful questions for everybody. I'd also really like to thank our panelists. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time and insights. Um, and I'd like to thank two key players of the cause team, Jake Jensen and Tanya Kelly, who had played a really critical role in making this all happen. Um, and finally, let's see if I can paste in a link and talk at the same time. Um, I'd love to encourage everybody to continue looking at um, uh, the cause events page um, for additional events that may be of interest uh, as a large and diverse institution or as a large and diverse college. We actually have multiple events happening today <laughs> um, as well as this weekend. So uh, you can choose between student recitals. You can choose between a great student production of cabaret. Um, again, just a really 
a lovely reminder, um, as this has been of the many <laughs> and diverse ways in which our students and faculty and staff are making an impact. So thank you all again, really appreciate the chance to hear and be inspired by the stories of what you on the screen have been doing. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, and I wish you all a great rest of the evening.